Thank you very much. Marshall, I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and I'm reminded of a story which uh, was told many years ago by the former governor of Wyoming, who one day was visiting the state penitentiary. And as the um, inmates were assembled for the evening meal, the warden unexpectedly called on the uh, governor to make a few remarks. So without thinking, the governor started out by saying, uh, fellow citizens, well, the, the smiles of the uh, convicts reminded him that they'd lost their citizenship when they had been convicted. So he started again, and this time he said, uh, fellow convicts. Uh, that was, of course, even worse, and that brought loud guffaws. So he tried to collect himself, and as a last resort, he hastily explained, well, men, I don't know what to call you, but I'm, but I'm so glad to see so many of you here. <laughs> well, I'm pleased to have so many here from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, and I'm also pleased to note that a distinguished colleague of mine, Ambassador Eagleburger, happens to come from this hometown, which I just discovered today, and uh, he has had and still has a distinguished career in the Foreign Service and the State Department. Well, the Middle East certainly has attracted attention in the last weeks and years, and I am going to try to give you a flavor of what happened in the past and what is happening now. And I think about two weeks ago, many of you listened to President Reagan on television when he very dramatically appeared and described a framework for peace which the United States supports, peace in the Middle East. I would submit that someday historians may look back at this statement, at this initiative, as perhaps marking a point of departure uh, with regard to arriving at a peace in the Middle East. Let's hope so in any case. Shortly I'll tell you why I think this to be the case. But before I get into that stage, let me very briefly sketch to you, for those of you who may not, may be a little fuzzy about the background of this Arab-Israeli dispute, give you a little feeling for how it started so together we can appreciate where we are today. Now the state of Israel grew out of the Zionist uh, concepts articulated by an Austrian Jew by the name of Theodor Herzl at the end of the 19th century. And he wrote a book called Der Judenstaat in which he advocated the creation of a separate Jewish state. And at that time he saw this as an answer to the pogroms that had been conducted in Eastern Europe, and as the fulfillment of a strong attachment among members, many members of the Jewish community, of for a homeland. Now, while at first favoring the concept of the resurrection of, of ancient Israel, as it was in the Bible, at first Mr. Herzl had no particular place in mind. The important thing in his view was to envelop this new state in the mystique of the ancient Israel so it would ensure its appeal and success. And it was only as he was finishing his book that um, one of his, that he decided that Palestine obviously was a logical venue for this state. And a story is told of how shocked one of Herzl's colleagues was to discover after he read up about Palestine that it was already occupied by other people. And that was the start of the problem. There, fa there followed the famous Balfour Declaration during World War I, in accordance with which the British promised uh, the Jews that uh, they would get a national home in Palestine if the Allies won the war against the Turks. The Turks, in the form of the Ottoman Empire, were then controlling that area uh, in the, in the con contingency that they were defeated. Well, the Turks, of course, were defeated. And in the subsequent years, uh, the British allowed Jews in increasing numbers to emigrate to Palestine. Well, it was during World War II when Hitler's atrocities 
gave this Zionist movement a tremendous fillip as the world, for very good reasons, sympathized with the proposition that the survivors should be granted a new life in Palestine. And so the State of Israel was formed in 1948 out of the crucible of war with the Arabs who opposed this. And uh, in this war, the, which the Arabs started, they also lost. Now, at the same time that the Zionists were moving ahead and creating the state of uh, Palestine, creating a separate political identity for the Jews, the Arabs, some of whom fought with the British in World War I against the Turks, were seeking to establish their own political identity, not just in Palestine, but in the broader area of the Near East. Ruled for centuries by foreign powers, here the Arabs saw in the aftermath of World War I an opportunity for independence and self-rule, reminiscent of the days of the flowering of uh, Arab civilization in the 9th and 10th century, when the Arab civilization was at its peak. So you had a situation where while one leader of the British government, Lord Balfour, was offering the Jews a national home in Palestine, another British official by the name of Mr. McMahon made a promise to the Arabs in return for their support in fighting the Turks that after the war they could have an independent state that would include Palestine. This complicated the issue even more. So because of these conflicting claims, the British decided to ignore both and they created a Palestine mandate, a kind of colonial arrangement in Palestine and French mandates were created in Lebanon and Syria just north and, and east. And so were dashed the Arab hopes for a federated state. Between the two major wars, the Arabs viewed with increasing misgivings the mounting influx of Jews coming into Palestine. And in 1947, when the United Nations proposed partition of Palestine between the two groups, uh, the Arabs strenuously opposed this. They said, this is our country, and there's no reason we should split it up in half. Uh, but they lived to regret this because while the UN partition plan gave them 54% of Palestine, after the war of 1948, the Jewish armies, later becoming the Israeli army, took over 80% of the territory. And in the, during the war and in the wake of the war, some three quarters of a million Palestinians fled to neighboring Arab countries. Now, in the ensuing years, these Palestinians, displaced Palestinians, were at first considered refugees. This is what we call them. And a UN organization was created uh, to take care of the needs of those who were unable to uh, find jobs and establish uh, their own lives. Most Arab governments, with the exception of Jordan, however, were reluctant to accept these displaced Palestinians because they thought that if they did, this would remove the pressure on Israel <clears throat> ever to allow them, these Palestinians, to return to what had now become the state of Israel. Now, over the years, the Palestinian <clears throat> political consciousness became more acute. And this happened particularly after the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, the third Arab-Israeli War, uh, in, at which time the Israelis annexed the remainder of Palestine. That is the West Bank. They also annexed the Golan Heights of Syria and the Gaza Strip. There had been an organization by the name of the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, that had operated for a number of years fairly ineffectively. But it was after the 67 war when they lost the West Bank that a new leader came along by the name of Yasser Arafat, a civil engineer who galvanized the PLO into a guerrilla group plus a political activist group. And it grew so strong that it began to threaten the regime, regime of King Hussein in Jordan. In 1970, 1970, there was a confrontation between the PLO and King Hussein. He suppressed them, and the rem remnants fled to Lebanon, which, of course, led to complications there. There they contributed to Lebanon's internal problems. Uh, from there, they also occasionally uh, engaged in cross-the-border raids into Israel. But in the broader political context, the PLO, 
movement, led by Arafat, sharpened the Palestinian sense of national identity. And indeed, it put the Palestinians on the world map. So that today, the Palestinian claim, and some people say right, uh, to some kind of nationhood is generally, rec generally acknowledged and recognized by virtually the, the entire world. Well, there were a lot, number of U.S.-led initiatives in the 50s, the 1960s, and the early 1970s to try to resolve this problem. They all failed, but there was a, a peace formula developed in the United Nations in 1967, which has served as the basis for all these initiatives, and indeed is the underpinning of the President's uh, proposals last uh, two weeks ago, namely that in return for Israeli withdrawal from these occupied territories, the Arabs, for the first time, would make a commitment to live at peace with Israel. Now, Secretary Rogers uh, had a plan in 1971 on the basis of this. Secretary Kissinger uh, pursued efforts uh, also following this idea. Uh, all these efforts failed, and in 1973, President Sadat of Egypt decided to take things in his own hand. He took a calculated risk to force the issue, and he launched a war against Israel. Now, at the time, President Sadat had no intention to defeat Israel, that is, uh, a, a total defeat. What he had in mind was a limited victory hoping that then a ceasefire would be declared, as it was, and that this then would help to trigger more effective action toward producing a final settlement. Mr. Kissinger followed with the shuttle diplomacy. The Geneva Conference was called. Uh, then Mr. Sadat made his dramatic visit to Israel. And following that, you know about the Camp David Agreement that Mr. Carter um, <coughs> presided over. Now, the Camp David Agreement, signed about five years ago, was significant because it brought peace to Egypt for the first time in 30 years. It reduced the threat of war between Israel and Egypt. It represented the first instance of Israeli withdrawals from occupied territory because during the 67 war, they had also occupied the Sinai to the south of Israel, which was Egyptian territory. And it was, people hoped that it would lead to movement on the Palestinian front, that is, withdrawals on the, from the West Bank, the Golan Heights, and Gaza. On the other hand, the problem with the Camp David Agreement was that <clears throat> it was originally intended to be a comprehensive agreement, dealing more effectively with the Palestine problem. And since it gave the Israel Israelis a veto over the Palestinian urge for ultimate self-determination, it was unable to get the cooperation of either the Jordanians or any other Arab governments or the PLO. But I think that even with this <coughs> gap in the Camp David Agreement, King Hussein might have participated in the Camp David negotiations had Prime Minister Begin, after he went back to Israel from Camp David, not <coughs> undermined the agreement almost immediately after it was signed. Once he got back to Israel, he made public pronouncements and he set in motion policies that were not at all in consonance with the Camp David Agreement. First, despite President Carter's understanding that Prime Minister Begin had agreed to suspend building Israeli settlements on the West Bank uh, during the transitional period while they were working for Palestinian autonomy, Mr. Begin not only continued building these settlements, but he, in the course of time, quadrupled their number. For the acknowledged purpose, as a key Israeli official has acknowledged, of rendering it difficult for the Arab population on the West Bank to unite and create territorial and political continuity. And such continuity and such unity, of course, is what autonomy is all about. <clears throat> Meanwhile, unfortunately, Mr. Begin uh, was appointing, uh, had appointed an administrator who ruled the West Bank with an iron fist and uh, deposed elected mayors and was making life very difficult for the inhabitants. Uh, the result was that it became clear that Mr. Begin's concept of autonomy was quite a different matter from the concept of the Camp David Agreement. What he had in mind essentially was some Palestinian control over the Palestinian population, 
but not sovereignty over the land, which was provided for by the Camp David Agreement. Indeed, it became evident that Mr. Begin's ultimate aim was not to give up this occupied territory, but to annex it uh, in perpetuity. Now, during this period, the U.S. government was not without blame. Our failure to set clear limits on Mr. Begin's uh, actions encouraged him to believe that he could go as far as he pleased without fear of U.S. opposition, even though many of his policies were jeopardizing our broad national interests in the area. And in addition to his settlements policy on the West Bank, last year he took the law into his own hands, international law that is, and ordered Israeli bombers to fly thousands of miles, hundreds of miles over the airspace of Arab states friendly to us to attack the Iraqi nuclear reactor outside of Baghdad, which incidentally was nowhere near uh, to developing an atomic bomb and was open to international inspection. He then ordered a bombing raid in Beirut, over Beirut, in order to get at these Palestinian armed elements living there. But in the process, unfortunately, his planes, uh, his American planes, uh, killed many more Lebanese civilians than they did Palestinians. All of you, of course, are aware of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon this past summer, which resulted in some 15,000 Lebanese civilians killed and four times that wounded. Now, the irony of this invasion by Israel of Lebanon was that the PLO armed elements <coughs> that Israel was attacking, who had operated out of southern Lebanon occasionally in earlier years against Israel, had for the previous nine months refrained from any such attacks against Israel as a result of a ceasefire negotiated by Ambassador Habib. It also turned out that the PLO had nothing to do with the assassination of the Israeli ambassador in London, which supposedly triggered the invasion. Meanwhile, the United States sat idly by, doing nothing, while we mildly slapped Israel's wrists for the bombings last year. We did absolutely nothing with regard to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, either condemn the invasion or to try to nip it in the bud. The trouble with this was it led the Arabs, including our best Arab friends such as Saudi Arabia and Jordan, to conclude that the United States had acquiesced in this invasion. And the fact that American planes and bombs were used in killing these innocent civilians implicated us further. So what, you de what developed was a wave of anti-Americanism uh, which put great pressure on the friendly, moderate Arab regimes to disassociate themselves from us and even to invoke sanctions against us. Keep in mind, in this context, the strategic significance of the Middle East, especially the Persian Gulf, and the golden opportunity offered to the Soviets by growing Arab disenchantment with the U.S. So we were in danger of being seriously victimized in the area by these Israeli aggressions and expansionist policies. This is not to say that the Arab governments also were without, a, without fault. Until very recently, with the exception of Sadat, they had been reluctant to accept the existence of Israel. And they missed many opportunities in the past to negotiate with Israel for a just and lasting peace. In 1947, for example, they opposed the partition plan, which I mentioned earlier, Ten years later, they said they were prepared to accept it, but it was too late. In 1967, after the Third Arab-Israeli War, Israel was ready to give back this territory they had just occupied uh, in, during the war in return for an Arab recognition of Israel uh, and permanent peace, but the Arabs refused. Years later, when Arab governments changed their views, changed their minds, and decided that this was, after all, the best deal that they could get, Israel had become so accustomed to occupying the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights and living there that they became reluctant to give it up. Over the years, also, the Arabs have declared Israel to be enemy number one, giving forth such anti-Israeli bombast that many Israelis, understandably, came to the conclusion that their country was truly threatened with annihilation. <clears throat> 
and this brought forth, of course, a fear of another Holocaust. And acts of terrorism by extremist factions of the PLO reinforce this view, with Israelis forgetting, I guess, that every nationalist movement has had men of unrestrained passion who, in their outrage at what they perceive to be injustices, will indulge in terrorism in the mistaken belief that this will advance their cause. The top PLO leadership in recent years has disapproved of such acts, just as the leaders of the Haganah of Palestine, that, was, that is the Jewish militia operating there before Israel was created, opposed the terrorism perpetrated by the extremist Jewish armed factions, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, led respect, respectively by now Prime Minister Begin and now Foreign Minister Shamir. Yet in the last few years, there has been a further evolution in the Arab position, crowned last week by the resolutions put forward at the Arab summit in Morocco. Now, while these resolutions don't go far enough to satisfy either the United States or the Israelis, they do, and this is important, offer implicit, implicit recognition of Israel by all Arab governments, with the exception of Libya. We can write off Muammar Gaddafi. He's, he's not respected by any Arab government, let alone the rest of the world. Now, this is very important because whereas before, as reflected in a plan put forward by Saudi Arabia about a year and a half ago called the Fahad Plan, uh, some of the moderate Arab governments had expressed implicit willingness to do, make peace with Israel on the basis of this formula I referred to. This had not applied to the other Arab governments. So now it does. And what you have is an Arab summit, which for the first time since the creation of Israel 34 years ago, presented proposals uh, representing all the Arab nations uh, coming forward in favor of living at peace with Israel. Uh, these proposals obviously are still deficient, but they are a step forward and we have to in understand them in the Arab context and in terms of relativity. What has changed this summit, uh, these summit proposals represent to the original mainstream Arab position 25, 30 years ago, that the Israeli state should be dismantled and Jews who arrived there after 90, 1948 should be expelled. Now there's no question in my mind that the President's statement two weeks ago on September 1st contributed to this relatively pragmatic and positive uh, Arab position. And that is why the statement was so timely. It both disabused the Arabs of the growing belief that the U.S. supported Mr. Begin's policies and it demonstrated that the U.S. still t stands by the internationally acknowledged basic formula which I referred to, an Israeli exchange of occupied territory for an Arab commitment of peace. But more than that, the President has now promised an active U.S. role in peace negotiations, not just one of mediator. Now, while the President's initiative uh, fell short of what the Arabs want in return for peace with Israel, for example, uh, we do not support the creation, according to the President, of an independent Palestinian state on the West Bank, the U.S. plan does not necessarily rule this out eventually, once, or maybe I should say, if and when, Arabs and Israelis get accustomed to living peacefully side by side and mutual suspicions begin to melt. Now, recognition of this possible eventuality may enable the PLO under the relatively moderate leadership of Yasser Arafat to give King Hussein of Jordan the go-ahead to enter peace negotiations with Israel on the Palestinians' behalf. On the other hand, it may not. We'll just have to wait and see. But despite Israel's current firm opposition to the creation of a Palestinian state, incidentally a position shared by all the political parties in Israel, not just of the Likud. I think that as the years pass, and assuming the coming to fruition of a confederation of Jordan and the West Bank, which is what the President calls for, uh, 
I think the Israeli position uh, could well change. As they become comfortable with the idea of living side by side with a Palestinian entity under the Jordanian umbrella, which poses no threat to Israel, which would indeed be a condition for uh, its establishment, the Israeli government may find it to be in Israel's interest that this entity be independent from Jordan on the basis that a separate Palestinian state would be more susceptible to Israeli influence and more of a hostage to Israeli military might. The fact that this state would be demilitarized and that any peace treaty would bring with it guarantees, U.S. guarantees of Israel's security would be important factors in the situation. Obviously, the contingency that uh, I'm talking about is at best a long, long way off. Now, from the Israeli vantage point, the President's initiative should be viewed as positive, I think, because it reaffirms in the most emphatic manner the standing U.S. commitment to Israel's security and integrity, and it offers the Israelis not just the best, but the only possible and practical road to peace. At the same time, it offers Israel the only way in the years ahead to preserve its democratic nature and its Jewishness, two factors, after all, that today constitute the essence of Israel. Now, you may ask, how is this so? It is so because Mr. Begin's goal of absorbing one million Arab Palestinians and ruling them by force, as Israel would do if it held on to this occupied territory in perpetuity, would mean degrading and weakening Israel's democratic system, since the government could hardly be democratic toward rebellious Palestinians. And also by the year 2000, there are expected to be more Arabs under Israeli control than Jews, if the Israelis don't withdraw, because of the much higher Arab birth rate, hardly a prescription for a Jewish state. This is why enlightened Israelis, as represented by the Labor Party, as well as politically active American Jewish organizations, such as APAC and Rene Berith, have come out in support for the President's initiative. They see that herein lies the best hope for peace. Like the Arabs, they too have reservations concerning some aspects of the President's proposals, but nevertheless, they support them as a sound and fair framework for negotiations. I believe that President Reagan will remain steadfast, uh, despite the current Israeli government's uh, adamant rejection of his initiative. And the question obviously is, can the U.S. be successful in pursuing this course if one party, Israel, rejects it out of hand and the other party, the Arabs, impose conditions, imposes conditions impossible to satisfy, at least in the near future? It is possible, in my view, that Mr. Begin might relent from his position as he finds that the American president, for a change, will not back down in the face of his actions, and that the American Jewish consensus, and hopefully the Israeli consensus, as time passes, opposes his outright rejection. After all, as we look back, Mr. Begin did finally give up the Sinai in the context of making peace with Egypt, although earlier he said he would never do so. But I think we have to face reality to Mr. Begin, the West Bank is not the same as the Sinai. He contends that the West Bank, or Judea and Samaria as he calls it, was deeded to Israel by God way back, and therefore Israel will never give it up. I think he means what he says. So in my personal view, we will have to wait for the Labor Party to come to power in Israel before launching negotiations on the basis of the President's proposals. In any case, time will be needed for the full impact of the U.S. initiative and the positive, though qualified, Arab response to have the full import of the U.S. initiative and the positive, though qualified, Arab response.
to have impact on the Israeli public. The latter has not yet come to uh, appreciate the positive evolution in the Arab position, but I think it will more as the months go by. Now, by the time the next elections in Israel are held, which could conceivably be next spring, let us hope that the Israeli consensus will have come around and that there will be sufficient support within Israel to enable the new prime minister to have a mandate to negotiate on the basis of the U.S. initiative. It is also to be hoped that King Hussein, by this time, King Hussein of Jordan, will have a similar mandate from the Arabs. If territorial expansionism and military aggression continue to characterize Israeli policy, and if on the other hand, and if as a result, the Arabs return to rejectionism, it is Israel that will suffer the most in the long run. Israel's failure to capitalize on current Arab moderation while it still exists may contribute to the eventual demise of moderate Arab regimes, a radicalization of the Arab world as a whole, and an Arab refusal to make peace with Israel on any terms. In these circumstances, successor Arab regimes, representing over 150 million people, and, and by this time irrevocably bent uh, on the destruction of Israel, would bide their time waiting over a period of decades for overwhelming Arab democratic, demographic superiority, both within Israel as well as surrounding it, along with other factors to overpower Israel, a country of less than five million. These other factors would include a marked increase in Arab military strength and technological know-how, and the growing and more immense economic burden to Israel of meeting the cost of a large and increasingly more expensively equipped military establishment, uh, incidentally financed by the U.S. taxpayer. Obviously, such a development is neither in Israel's nor in the U.S. interest. Therefore, it behooves all of us to give full support, in my view, to the President's initiative, to persuade doubting Israelis to see the light at the same time to induce the Arab governments who are beginning, beginning to move in the right direction to be more explicit in their recognition of Israel and to be prepared to enter into negotiation with Israel. With luck, we may just possibly be seeing the beginning of the narrowing of the gap between the Israelis and the Arabs despite the tragic assassination of the president-elect of Lebanon yesterday. Thank you.